Welcome, everyone. I'm Marilyn Shera, GBH News reporter and producer, and welcome to Beyond the Page. In a few minutes, we will be joined by Colleen Hoover, author of It Ends With Us, Verity, and her brand new novel, Reminders of Him, and of course, many, many more. But before we get started, I would like to review a few things with you. I want to explain how this evening's event is going to work. We will be using Zoom webinar. Now, as our audience, we cannot see or hear you, but this is important. We do want to hear from you. You can ask questions during the course of the conversation by opening the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of your screen, and you can type in your questions there. And we really welcome those, of course, that's what this is all about. You can put your questions in at any point in time during our conversation this evening, and I will ask them for you to Colleen. We'll do our best to address as many questions as we can throughout the night. Uh, we'll try and weed out any duplicate questions. So if your question is also asked by someone else, we'll, we'll handle that as well. Um, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, you can vote for it by giving the thumbs up uh, icon in the Q&A tabs. That's pretty simple to do. Uh, so many of our, us are familiar now with Zoom webinars by this point, right? The most popular questions, of course, will be at the top of that list. So now here's a couple of simple instructions. To activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. Now you can select either the live transcript, two transcription display options will pop up. Now we recommend that you select a subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. So, uh, but keep in mind, please bear in mind that the captioning, there might be a slight delay with that. All right, so I think we um, are all set to go. Um, we're trying to keep this a constructive conversation. And uh, please let us know what town you are tuning in from before you pose your question in that Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And we ask you to follow all of our community guidelines, um, bullying or inappropriate comments or comments containing profane language will be removed. We have to do that. So thank you again for attending Beyond the Page and for contributing to a very productive um, evening and um, cordial discourse and this month's author, Colleen Hoover. So now without any further delay, let me please welcome Colleen Hoover. She is our number one New York Times bestselling author of many novels, including Regretting You, It Ends With Us, and of course, the psychological thriller Verity. Hoover and her family founded the Bookworm Box in 2015. It's a bookstore and monthly subscription service that offers assigned novels uh, donated by many authors. All profits go to various charities each month to help those in need. Her novel Confess was filmed as a series by Ostrock and that was released in 2017. And in July, 2019, um, Wayfair Entertainment headed by the Jane the Virgin star, Justin Baldoni announced they op optioned it for End With Us for film. So that's super exciting. And we'll of course talk about all of that. Colleen currently lives in Texas with her husband and her three sons. And I welcome you, Colleen Hoover. Nice to have you joining me. Hello. Hello. So good to be here. <laughs> it's so great to welcome you. I'm uh, super excited as uh, along with all of our guests that are joining us virtually. I know you have a big fan base and um, we want to get right into learning more about you as the author. Of course, we enjoy uh, reading all the books you've written, but um, tell us about yourself a little bit. Um, what about like what sparked you to write some of the stories you've chosen to write about? And more importantly, where do you draw those influences from? <laughs> uh, I think it's more like, how do I shut them off? I <laughs> feel like I have so much running through my head at any given time that uh, it's, it's more of a challenge to kind of focus on one storyline and one set of characters because uh, I can only write one book at a time. But um, yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to be a writer since I was before I could write. I remember at the age of four wishing I knew how to write. Um, I just, you know, I started a family young and in college didn't really think that I could make a career and support my family on a on a writing degree. So I ended up majoring in social work and it wasn't until I was 31, about 10 years ago that I started writing my first book. 
And what brings you the most joy about writing? I, you know, I always say, like, even to my children, you want to make sure that what you do, you love. Yeah. You, you know, you don't um, work to live. You, li you, you don't live to work. You work to live. Yeah. So it must bring you a certain amount of joy. You've written so Ab many books. Absolutely. Like, I cannot believe that this is my actual career and job <laughs> because I would be telling stories to no one if I, if, you know, if that's what it, what it had to be. I just... I don't know. It's always been my hobby. I, I've always enjoyed, you know, writing little short stories for my friends and family. Um, when I was a little kid, I would get up and read kind of morbid Thanksgiving stories at the dinner table. And um, I've just always loved getting out all the things that were in my head. And I'm not so much a verbal communicator as much as I am on paper. And so that's just the way I communicated growing up. And then it luckily ended up turning into my career. So I get to do that for a living and it's incredible. And what about what you like to read? Um, do you have a genre of your own that maybe is different from what you write about? I actually had never read a romance novel before I wrote my first romance novel. <laughs> I thought I didn't like them. I was one of those people and I, I assumed wrong. I um, was really into like true crime and biographies. And um, when I sat down and started writing my first book was around the time I was reading like all the Charlene Harris, Sookie Stackhouse novels. And I really enjoyed them. You know, they were fun. It kind of was an escape from my chaotic life. And it stayed that way since I started writing. I love contemporary romance. Um, every now and then I'll pick up a thriller, but it's mainly contemporary romance that I enjoy reading. That's interesting, um, but I can understand that. Um, what about from all your novels, which character left um, the most impact on you? And what would you say to them if you could talk to them? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I think that Lily from Mid Ends With Us definitely left the most impact on me. And that may be because that was like the one book that um, I took from from people I knew in real life. And so she kind of means a lot to me because I fashioned her a little bit after my mother. And if I could say something to her, I would just say, good job. Interesting, huh, good job. Uh, do you have a character that you relate to? You mentioned about this one, um, uh, you wrote about it, but your mom, that, that you relate to the most in terms of who you are and how you feel about things in life. Um. I, as an author, I think we put a little bit of ourselves into every character, whether we want to or not. I always try to avoid that. Like I want my characters to be like individual people for me, but probably um, Kenna from Reminders of Him. Like I just, the love she has for this daughter is like my kids are my number one. I, you know, of course, like everyone put them before everything. And um, that book was just really tough to write and seeing her in that situation. And I feel like um, I would fight for my child the way that she is trying to fight for hers. Mm -hmm. And um, do you draw some of uh, the characters from people you know and Absolutely change them? <laughs> I don't want anyone I know seeing themselves in my books. I don't want them getting mad at me. I don't want them making <laughs> assumptions. So I absolutely try to avoid that. With my first book, I used a little bit of my kids in there um, with the kids in the story. I didn't think anyone was going to read it. I even named one of the characters after one of my kids. And um, and since then, I've tried I've tried to not do that. Mm -hmm. I could understand that. Are we are asking as a reminder, everybody, if you have a question, um, to, you'd like to ask Colleen a question, please add your questions to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. It's located at that toolbar on the bottom. And we're going to try and answer everyone's questions. And we do already have some that have piled up. So I'll just jump in. Uh, yeah. All right, Colleen, and start with one of the questions. This is from Jordan Simpson. He's from Cranston, Rhode Island, and his question is, I was wondering how difficult it was to write from a male perspective as a woman, and if you write the male leads to appeal to female readers. Um, I do find male characters more challenging than female characters, but I also feel like sometimes we take liberty as authors 
especially in romance and writing male characters more how we wish they would be than how they actually are. Yes. Um, so I don't know how accurate they are, but at the same time, I don't know that I really want to write a truly accurate male character. Um, you know, like my husband, he loves sports and you know, he's, he's just a guy's guy. And, and I don't necessarily want to write about all of that in, in my book. So it is a <laughs> challenge. It is, you know, it's different. It's very different from um, the female perspectives that I write, but um, hopefully, Hopefully, I, I pull them off okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the other questions is from John uh, Pustaver. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He doesn't say where he's from, but his question is, who are your favorite authors? You talked about genres that you liked. Um, yeah. um, within the contemporary romance genre, I am a huge fan of Tiffany de Bartolo. She wrote A God-Shaped Hole, um, How to Kill a Rock Star, Sorrow, she just writes really great romances, but it's her writing that is just phenomenal. Like the sentences she uses, um, huge fan of hers. I've really recently, I'm gonna put this pen down. <laughs> I recently have gotten into um, Emily Henry. I love her books a whole lot. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I really liked Sally Thorne's The Hating Game. I, I loved her um, comedic levity and I, I, I really, when I read that, I want to write a, a romantic comedy so bad, but every <laughs> time I try, something tragic happens. So. <laughs> and then you have to stick to what you know, I guess, right? right, right. <laughs> um, here's a good question. This is from, uh, she says, hi, Colleen, um, Becca from Chelmsford, Mass. What does your writing process look like? I'm curious about that as well. <laughs> Hi, Becca. I have no process. <laughs> I am probably the most chaotic person you will ever meet. I, I just last month, Kristen is so proud of me. My publicist um, got a calendar, a Google calendar. Um, I, I really would just wake up in the mornings and be like, okay, what's on the schedule today? Do I have time to write? Do I not? Um, I don't like scheduling writing time. To me, I have to feel creative and that's mm -hmm. not something that I feel every day. And so I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to force a word count. Sometimes I'll get up and write for an hour in the mornings. Sometimes I'll write five days straight. Sometimes I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning and write. Mm -hmm. I just kind of let my creativity guide me. I, and I, I am not an organized person at all. So that's pretty much what my writing process looks like. I did see on your website. In fact, I'm going to give out your website, Colleen's website for those of that are interested. Of course, it's um, Colleen uh, Hoover.com with, you know, the WW before it, um, that you had an Instagram post and you blurred out all your sticky notes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I have a weird like outlining process. I probably spend most of my time outlining but most of my outline never ends up in the book and when I say outlining like some it just depends on the type of book I write but sometimes I'll um write what I'm gonna write like he's going to do this and he's going mm -hmm. to do this and not really write the story and then I may end up writing one scene that ends up going into the actual book I just feel like writing a bunch of garbage <laughs> every now and then I can pull out a piece that isn't trash and use that in the actual book so I would say that I probably write four times the length of my book throughout throughout the journey of one novel wow that's a lot yeah I mean I I, I can relate just a teeny bit as a reporter when we when writing stories like I always try and write in the morning because I'm fresh but I can also relate. And I think other people too, who or read, you know, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you want to read, or you do have that feeling inside of you. Um, and you overwrite, you know, I always check the word count yeah. too, when I write. And you, you know, overwrite. I used to think that that was a negative thing. Like when I first started out with my first book, especially if I wrote something and then decided not to use it, I would be so hard on myself and, and be like, I can't do this. I can't write. But as I, as I went on and, and published more books, I realized that's part of my writing process. Like writing stuff I'm not going to use is, is how I get to the point of writing what I'm going to use. So I think that's where a lot of people give up is, is in that process of writing stuff that they're not happy with. And then they give up and think they can't do it. But if they just keep going, they might get to that sentence or that paragraph or that page that um, really sticks with them and sparks a whole nother idea. And do you understand why so many people are curious about the methodology of writing? 
Yeah, I absolutely understand it because before I started writing, I, I was the same way. I wanted to know everyone's process. I thought there was a right and a wrong way to do it. But now that I have so many writer friends, I, I see that the writing process is like thumbprints. Everyone is different. Everyone thrives in a different space, thrives in a different way. And so when you ask another writer or when writers even ask me like, hey, give me some advice. I'm like, I can't because I, I'm not you. Like every single one of us sits mm. down and does it in a different way. And I really don't think there's a wrong way to do it. You just that have to sense. find your right way. We have a question from Julia Chinman. Hi, she says, Julia from New York. What are your feelings on your books turning into movies? Is this in your future, which from the beginning when I introduced you, we do know that um, there is a movie in the works for It Ends With Us. So um, what's your answer on that? I, you know, I, I would love to see them become movies. I've um, sold film rights to several of my books that never turned into anything and the rights reverted back to me. And then I've got probably four out right now with, with different producers and studios. And so I don't put a lot of energy into it simply because writing books is what I love to do and, and that's my career. And so if someone else comes along that I feel like would be a good fit for a book, then I, I would love to let them have that opportunity, but I don't need to be involved in every aspect of it. I don't have time to be, um, right. you know, and, and I, and I kind of would want to be, I, like I would love to write a script for one of my books, but my time's better spent writing books. And right. so um, I'm absolutely- Someone else can do the screenplay in other words. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not against that happening. It just hasn't really happened for me yet. I'm hoping that it ends with us, um, turns out, great and that that becomes a movie and um you know everything else that I've got out right now but I also don't spend a lot of time stressing about that side of it I worry about the book and the book world and um I, I it helps my sanity <laughs> good answer I like that all right we have Nancy from Simsbury Connecticut she says hi I'm a high school English teacher and I have some students who want to become writers what advice could I give to them and here's the follow-up. Did your teachers inspire you? And if so, uh, what advice did they give you? Um, I think the best advice for someone that age is to read. Read as much as you can. I think that there's no better way to learn how to write than to read. I remember when I um, was trying to write my first book, I bought so many books just so I could sit there and study them. Like I didn't even know how to you know, end, end a paragraph that was in a quote and then start the new paragraph. So not only to get like ideas of whether you want to write in first person, third person, present tense, past tense, um, but how does, how to structure a novel, um, you know, it's just, there's just no better way than to read. And I had, um, I went to a very, very small school and my English teacher will say this. She says that when, when I hit about 10th or 11th grade, there were like 12 people in my graduating class. It was so wow. small. Uh, Where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? In East Texas. I still live in the same town. My kids went to that school. Um, it's a little town called Saltillo. It was like 1A. But um, yeah, my English teachers say that after like 10th grade, they just let me do my own thing. <laughs> did they recognize this, the talent in you back then? I, I think so simply because she would encourage me and um, to enter things like we had a statewide writing contest that I ended up going to state in and I had passed like the district and regional levels and um, did that I think my junior and senior year and so um, it was definitely something they encouraged in me and um, especially during class like I absolutely loved to be the one to read out loud when we were reading books so I, the, everyone else in the class hated doing that. So I would just sit there and read for the whole hour. So they all knew like that was my passion. Everyone, you know, knew that um, I was the one that liked to read. I was the one that liked to write stories. I did the school newspaper, which was literally one page long because there wasn't much to report. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very encouraging. We're actually friends now. I had two English teachers growing up through junior high and high school, and I love them both dearly. That's great. 
I love doing that too. I remember reading, taking turns, the person in front, in front of you, behind you. It yeah. was so great. And like read ahead so you'd know. Yes, it was a happy time. Yeah, I, I had forgotten that we did that, but that that's great. Uh, all right, here's a great question from uh, Joanna Kerrigan. She's from Beverly, Mass. She says, hi, all my friends and I finish your book so quickly, usually in a day. What book took you the quickest to write and which took the longest? And she says, love you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I think Slammed, my very first book, was the quickest to write because I did not think people were going to read it or I would have spent six more months editing it. I still to this day wish I could go back and rewrite and edit that one. Um, the one that took me the longest was probably... I'd say maybe someday just because it was a collaboration with the musician and um, yeah, so we weren't only writing a book, we were writing a whole album of music that then was used in the book. So um, that one probably took the longest. I think we were, I was working on that one for a good year and a half. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Um, that is a long time, but um you know, creativity happens when it happens. Right. <laughs> um, we have another story that relates to some of the methodology. It's uh, Katie from Holliston. And she says, as you write, do your storylines evolve or do you know the framework of the story before you start? I always think I know the framework, but it always ends up being something completely different. So they absolutely do evolve. Um, I try to have like a beginning, middle and end in mind and maybe a few scenes and then I, I see where the characters take me, but almost always I end up going in a different direction or thinking of a different way to end it or thinking of a plot twist halfway through. Um, so I kind of write like I, like I schedule my life. I just let it kind of lead me and I try not to plan too much, but that all depends on the book. Like right now I'm writing, um, the sequel to It Ends With Us. So I am having to align, you know, timelines and character backstories that I maybe lightly mentioned in the first book. So I've got all kinds of notes around my office and note cards and sticky notes. And um, it really just depends on the book, how, how that works out. I think um, Verity was probably the one that I stuck to the most when it came to the outline. And what about it? Uh, this is my question. Um, your editing process, uh, you work, do you work with an editor and what's the back and forth like um, between, you know, the, before you get to the final product? I'm, I, I self edit a lot as I write. So I turn in pretty clean drafts. Um, I can't necessarily move on to the next chapter until every chapter before it is exactly how I want it. So oh. I may not know what's coming, but I will rewrite a chapter 20 times before I'll move on to the next one. Uh, so when I turn them in, they're usually pretty clean, but I also have in my back pocket, a little sister who edits. So she reads all of my books before I- Literally a little sister? Like you're yeah. in real- <laughs> She's my little sister and she is in the book world. She does editing for indie writers. And she actually, she's just super smart. She got all the brains of the family, but she majored in Arabic, Mandarin, and Spanish, and then wow. ended up working in the book world. Like she does cover design for a lot of publishers and um, is an editor. And she actually got into it after I did. Like once I got into it and she started kind of getting familiar with the book world as well, uh, she started doing my covers and doing my editing and then would hire on other people. So it's become a career for her. And so that helps having someone who's very good. She's she's very good and very knowledgeable at um you know like the structure of novels and grammar and everything so I usually give her the book for a quick pass before I then turn it in mm -hmm. for editing with my publisher which that usually takes five rounds I would say so you collaborate that's great yeah and um what about your parents what did you do you, do you mind if I ask you a little bit about your your family life growing up your parents if you, you and your sister sound like you're pretty uh, educated in terms of uh, schooled in, in English and languages. What What is your uh, background and their background? Well, actually, um, my father was a truck driver. <laughs> my mother was a house cleaner. We lived in a single wide trailer house until I started writing books. So we were very, very poor 
um, my mom just always encouraged education and going to college. And actually when I started college or when I started the application process for college, my senior year in high school, she had no idea that you could go to college for free if you were poor. You know, she didn't know about financial aid because she'd never been to college. And she was like, fill one out for me. I want to go to college. So my mom and I actually went to college together and she got her degree. We both got our degrees in social work. Um, so yeah, she- That's she, wild. Yeah. Wow. A very, very um, smart and independent woman. And, you know, we just have all come from a background that- surprises some people I think we I grew up on a dairy farm um but yeah we ended up all kind of doing what we wanted to do with our lives and we're all very very happy and proud of each other that's wonderful that sounds like a beautiful family I'm going to go to another question this is from Colleen uh, oh, I'm sorry, Katie. And she says, hi, Colleen. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. How do you avoid being pigeonholed into one genre by the publishing industry? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I just refused it. I refused it. I remember when I wrote my first thriller, that's when I left my publisher because they didn't want it. And I really wanted to do it on my own. And I wanted to be on my own for a little while. So I've been all over the place. Um, you know, I did some romance novels with them and I understood that they wanted to brand me a certain way, but my passion was in writing what I felt like writing, not what my brand was. And that terrified me. So I left them and put out a thriller and the thriller ended up doing really well. Then I did a paranormal romance with a different publisher. Now I'm back with the romance publisher I actually have three publishers right now. Wow. Yeah. I'm with oh Grand Central for a thriller. I, I have a book due with Montlake, which is an Amazon imprint. And then Atria, I'm doing, it starts with us with Atria. So I have, um, yeah, three publishers now and still some indie books. So I, I'm a big believer in doing what feels good for you for each book. I don't necessarily think every book should go the same path. And I mm -hmm. think that helped me a lot by just looking at the book I'm writing and being like, where do I see this fitting and, and going with that. Um, and luckily I, I have a great relationship with everyone I've worked with. Like I, I don't leave on bad terms with people. I feel like every aspect and or every person that's had a hand in my career has helped me get to where I am. So um, I've just been very grateful for all the experiences that I've had. And also that I've, I've been able to try it all. You know, I've done Amazon publishing, I've done indie, I've done trade. And um, so I, I, you know, I see the benefits and the negatives with all of them mm -hmm. and um, can now kind of figure out which is the best way to go. Well, you've answered a lot of questions in that one answer, which is great. <laughs> um, but um, one part of it that I did want to ask is, would you now consider tackling, you know, another genre since you, you have the romance novels, you have yeah. the thriller, and if so, what would it be? Is there anything like you're, you're thinking about? Um, I, I am absolutely open to writing any genre. Um, my kids, they only want me to write um, manga, <laughs> which I don't know <laughs> what will ever happen. Like anime, manga, <laughs> anime. Um, they're so into that. They wish that I would do that so that they would read one of my books, but I don't see that happening. Um, I would love to do a historical romance or a romantic comedy, which isn't a huge jump from contemporary romance, but, right. um, big enough that I would have to change up. I think my writing style a little bit so mm -hmm. um yeah I well, with three sons never. three sons they're going to have to learn how to read the, the writing their mom <laughs> does right <laughs> I tell them like if y'all would read these it would give y'all so many tips right <laughs> yes they'd be big hits with the ladies <laughs> then again do I really want that I don't know so well let's let's stick with that um um avenue that we're talking about with your family. One of the questions coming in from Carolyn McLeod is how do you create space in your life to write, especially this past few years? Has that been a challenge with the pandemic, being at home, with maybe your children being at home as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, this is another question like I feel very horrible answering because I feel very fortunate 
and that I have a husband who just 100% supports what I do and he has become Mr. Everything. Um, so he makes my life very easy. I haven't had to do laundry or dishes in years. Of course, him and the boys, they all do everything around the house so that I don't have to worry about it. And I realized not everyone has that. So I'm very lucky in that it, it has been, I think, easier for me to focus on writing because everyone around me makes that possible. Um, so if it's not too late, pick people to surround yourself with who will make your job easier, right? Uh, easier said than done. But yeah, I don't even remember what the question was. Did I answer it? <laughs> well, it was how did you, how, with the, I guess the pandemic, fitting it into your life? And you did answer it. You said, essentially, they're very yeah. helpful and they do a lot of the things around the house. They always used to say, it take behind every great man is a great woman. Well, in your case, behind a great woman and a great writer is a wonderful <laughs> husband and supportive children. And that's, right, right, that's really exactly. nice. To but also, as far as the pandemic goes, I did not write the entire year of 2020. I was so just not feeling creative. It was a weird year, I think, for everyone. I had to force myself to write a book in 2021 because I kind of got used to watching TV. <laughs> but, uh -huh. um, and I think that's why Reminders of Him kind of has this dark undertone because it just, you know, it wasn't a great time in everybody's lives. And I was feeling kind of down. And I think that leaked out into the book a little bit but um yeah I I slowed down a lot I really um, did like everyone else I'm sure so Colleen let's get um right back into it we still have a good amount of time left um here's a question coming in from Jillian Saftel she's from Attleboro Mass and uh she asks a question we touched upon a little bit but maybe since it's the second half hour of the of our, our session here she said what's a book you've read that you wish you had written yourself? Oh, that's a good one. Um, definitely all of Tiffany's that I mentioned earlier, Tiffany De Bartolo. She, um, I feel like um, the way she tells the story, I, I am familiar with and I can do, but the way she crafts a sentence, I cannot do. And so <laughs> when she writes, I just like, I'm in awe of everything she writes uh, the, in the depth of it. Um, also, my best friend, Taryn Fisher, same uh -huh. way, she crafts the best sentences, um, and her writing is so deep, um, so yeah, I do, I have trouble actually reading while I write, like if I'm actively writing a book, I cannot read because I just am full of imposter syndrome, because I think every book I read, I'm like, God, why didn't I write this? Why can't I do mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... I don't read while I write. That's it. That, 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 so I can understand that. I think a lot of readers could understand that too. It's hard to juggle between the two and you don't want to have that in your head. You mentioned right. before we took that break um, with uh, Maeve Buckley uh, about the GB, supporting GBH about during the pandemic you watched, especially that first year, 2020, we're almost at the two year mark now. Uh, you watched a lot of television. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if like what kind of shows you watched that any, if you get any, <laughs> inspiration like Bridgerton or something like that <laughs> I think I've seen everything I think I've seen everything there is to see on tv I watch so much tv but um yeah like I did the Bridgerton anything uh -huh. that came out on Netflix loves Ginny and Georgia um Tiger King um uh -huh. love documentaries like the um especially the ones that they make series about like the inventing Anna the recent one that just came out um, okay and then I'm a huge Bravo addict bravo uh -huh. TV, real housewives um Vanderbilt, i've seen all of them below deck wow yeah I, fascinating well my mom and my sisters were all really into that and so it's like we got we have a group chat where we just discuss all the shows during the week that's my um i don't know i feel like i watch that and my brain can rest because right. it's like reality tv it's just mm -hmm. entertainment and i don't have to be that invested and it really does kind of after using your brain all day working it's just really good to just relax and and watch some mindless tv every now and then i uh, i can totally understand that as i'm sure many of uh, the the viewers and listeners can as well all right let's get to another question um this one is uh from a reader in cranston rhode island do you expect to continue to incorporate the supernatural in your writing i was captivated by your book layla and was wondering if we can expect more 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I did not really enjoy writing them. And I think that's because I'm not, um, I'm not a huge believer in, in the supernatural. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge realist. And so it was a very big stretch for me to write that book. And, um, but, but I change like, you know, every few years, like my interests and what I want to write absolutely changes. So I don't think in the next year or two, you can expect that from me, but who's to say what's going to happen three to four to five years from now. Mm -hmm. I have no idea, but, um, I, and I don't want to say like, I didn't enjoy writing that book. I did. It was just a struggle. It was a struggle. Mm -hmm. That's understandable. All right. Next question. This is different. It's, um, she says, hi, Colleen, as a book talker, how has book talk affected your career? It's from Greta Hogblom on TikTok. Greta. So Greta <laughs> was on my last chat and um, I promised I would name a character in a scene after her. So I'm going to do that, Greta. Um, TikTok. Oh my gosh. TikTok has absolutely changed my life and I think the life of a lot of other authors. Mm -hmm. um, in what way if you don't mind me interrupting you so I have I have theories about it I could go on all day but um back at the beginning of the pandemic we were all bored out of our minds and I think a lot of people downloaded TikTok and out of that came book talk which is just a side of TikTok where people talk about books and to be fair I think it was mostly paperbacks and hardbacks and so I saw a shift in 2020 and my publisher saw the shift. I used to sell probably 80 to 90% eBooks for the first nine years of my career until 2020, that flip-flopped. And I started selling 80 to 90% paperback. And we were all like, what is happening? And it was TikTok. People wanted the books in their hands. They wanted to do videos with the books. They wanted to share books and buy books. And, and you can't do that with eBooks. And so this huge surge for just, physical books happened. And I just happened to be, I don't know why, one of the authors that trended on there in the beginning. And it, and it really bumped all of my books. I mean, my books were all hit the New York times the week they released, but that's, that's really it. And then they kind of faded away. Mm -hmm. But um, now I've had books on there for 40 weeks straight, you know, wow. because of TikTok. Yeah. It's been insane. There's a huge, huge, um, book talk world out there and people that maybe necessarily weren't readers before the pandemic. I think there are a lot more readers now than there were two years ago. Well, that's good to know. I, I was unaware of that. So I'm learning something while we're here. <laughs> um, all right. Another question um, uh, from Johnston, Rhode Island, Maryland. She says, hello, I host a book club of about 15 members, all ages and males, as well as females. Which of your books do you recommend for book clubs also, can you talk about your bookworm box program? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know what ages she means. Like, does she do teenagers in her book club? It, it says all ages. She says all ages, male and female. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend a lot of my books for a younger crowd. I don't feel comfortable telling teenagers to read my books, even though I know a lot of them do. Um, mm -hmm. But there are a few out there that are appropriate, like um, Heart Bones. I think maybe some days probably tame never never is more of a younger teenage story actually that mm -hmm. I wrote with a friend of mine um so I've got a few YA books in there um I would start with heart bones and see and see what the group thinks of that um I would definitely avoid verity if you've got anyone yeah all right that group. <laughs> that's fair that's fair oh, and, the, and the bookworm box um I started that with my sisters back in 2015 we um decided to open a subscription service online where we send signed books to people and then we donate the money to charity. And the, when we launched, we were, you know, kind of hoping that someone would buy some and we ended up raising $12,000 in four minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. So it, it, the first week we were like, okay, this is more than we think we can handle. And within <laughs> like two or three months, we ended up renting a store so we could house all of these boxes that we were having to pack and it's just grown from there we now have an annual signing where we have about 250 authors and 2,000 readers come and oh we donate gosh. all that money to charity um mm -hmm. the bookworm box has built a school in Malawi I and mean, we've just been able to do a lot of stuff because of the support of the book world and the support of authors who keep donating their signed books to us 
Wow, that's that's really wonderful. We're very philanthropic. Uh, we let's go to the next question from Mary Rialt. Uh, she says or asks, was it difficult to write? It ends with us. And then she adds, because it was very close to my experiences. It was very sad at times to read it, although I wanted to read it. Was it kind of a catharsis for you? Uh, absolutely. I, you know, if you read the author's note at the end, you'll see just how difficult it was for me simply because, um, you know, a lot of it was my mother and father's story. Of course, I, you know, invented Lily and Ryle as characters, but like the first time Lily is abused in the kitchen is exactly what happened between my mother and father. And so I think that just kind of putting myself in my mother's shoes and seeing the struggle she went through and having to, you know, leave my father when I was two years old and she had two daughters she had to support. And yeah, I mean, it was just very cathartic in the sense that I understood my mother more in her decisions and very cathartic for her as well. She, um, I didn't know this until I wrote the book, but she always questioned her decision. And she always wondered if she did wrong by her daughters by leaving him. Um, and I don't think she really got that closure until she was able to read the book from her daughter's perspective. Mm, okay, that's a good answer. Uh, here's another question uh, from Carolyn McLeod and she is in Boston and I'm just scrolling back up to the top. Um, and where did she go? She's, hold on, I'm sorry. I lost my place. Oh, here welcome. it is. She says, Colleen, Carolyn from Boston here, speaking of Boston, it's such a strong sense of place in your novel. It ends with us. Can you talk more about creating that sense of place? Yeah, I um, was working on this book when I went on tour for the previous book that I wrote before it. And I was in Boston and readers asked me during the signing if I would base a book in Boston. And I hadn't really I didn't have a location yet because I was just outlining it ends with us. And I was like, sure, I'll base this one in Boston. Um, I do take liberties, you know, I live in Texas. It's very different here than it is in Boston. Yes, and it is. So um, I, I, I read something. I just got this book in the mail the other day by Christina Lauren, and they have like a disclaimer in the beginning. And they were like, we did our research, but this is also a book and we need things to kind of go with our story. So we might change things and we might not talk about the weather and we might not do this. And um, I kind of wish I would put that disclaimer at the beginning of It Ends With Us because I'm sure to a true Bostonian, there are some things in there. Like I, I, the restaurant, the street it's on doesn't even exist. I didn't want to use a real street. The city that she grew up in is called Plethora in Maine, and that doesn't exist. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I do take a lot of liberties. I don't really like to use real businesses and real streets um, just because I don't want to um, get in trouble, <laughs> really. Right. But um, yeah, like, I loved Boston while I was there. I loved the crowd, and I was like, I'm going to write this book for you guys. But I do plan on um, going there soon and spending a couple of weeks while I work on the follow up. I'm oh, excited. awesome. Awesome. Come, come, come visit us at GBH. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> yes. We're starting to open up, you know, a little bit through with the, the pandemic now. Yeah. And, um, here's a good question from Mary in Waltham and speaking of Massachusetts. She says, do you integrate your own knowledge and understanding of the world into your writing or do you conduct research to understand, develop your characters? And if so, how? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I definitely, you know, I spent 10 years in social work as a child protective investigator. Um, so I feel like I brought a lot into some of the stories I've written from that area. Um, and then also I write about characters who grew up from a poor background and I feel like I'm able to relate to that and, and I have that firsthand knowledge. So it really just depends on what it is. There are definitely things that um, I didn't have familiarity with. Like I wrote a book that had to do with um, infertility and I wrote a book that had um, a deaf main character, you know, things like that, that I haven't experienced firsthand. What I like to do is I like to write the book and experience it from the character's perspective and then find someone more than one someone's that can then after the book is finished go back and say you got this wrong you got this right you mm -hmm. might want to tweak this so I more do research when I'm finished with my book than before because I don't want the research of a character 
or what the character is going through to um, affect my how I write them in any way. Like I want to write the story first and then sure. research comes at the end for me. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get in the way of your writing. Yeah. And do you ever feel like um, uh, somebody asked, and I'm sorry, I can't find it right now. But they talked about writer's block. Like what if something doesn't come up? And, and if so, if you have that writer's block, how, how do you cope with it? What do you do? Um, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in writer's block. I believe in creative lulls and that happens a lot. And like I was saying earlier, I just, I don't force it. Um, 2020 was a huge creative lull and I took time off and I watched TV. But one thing that really helps me get through that is um, consuming other forms of art. You know, I'll read books, I'll watch movies, I'll listen to music, I'll go on drives with sad music playing usually some form of art is going to trigger um, a feeling of creativity in me. And, and it, a lot of times when I'm having those moments, I'll sit down and watch, um, you know, like watch a movie and then a scene will then trigger something in my brain that's like, oh, I need to write this in my book. And then I'll get up and never finish the movie and start writing again. <laughs> I'm really wow. bad about that. So I do, I consume a lot of other forms of art to help me pick back up on my own. That's a good answer because uh, that create, that get the, the flow of creativity coming back to you through artwork. Um, I can totally relate to that. Um, here's a question that's interesting from Jude H. How did you get your fir first book published? I actually didn't. I self-published it. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I wrote my first book and put it on Amazon because I I didn't know anything about publishing. And <laughs> I remember researching how can I get this Word document of, of this file I had written onto a Kindle because my grandmother wanted to read it and she had just gotten a new Kindle. And in that research, I found that you could put your documents on Amazon and, and they would be a book. And so... I created a book cover using their template. Um, I uploaded this book January 1st of 2012. And by May, it had hit the New York Times. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't market it. It was simply just um, good luck and good timing, word of mouth. And then, um, so sometimes I feel like I haven't paid my dues as a writer. Like I didn't go through the whole querying and, um, and all of that. I, but I that speaks, it. that speaks to your, you know, expertise and creativity and, and, um, I, mean, I don't know, because I feel like if I released that book right now, it would get lost in the shuffle. I think it was good timing. And I mm -hmm. was writing, I wrote something like new adult was really hot then and brand new and everyone was wanting like that genre of book and I didn't even know what it was I had no idea I wrote a new adult novel and um so people that were already in the the small book world back then that there was started sharing it and so uh, just a lot of dominoes fell right at the same time in the right mm -hmm. direction and um and since then I've just kind of slowly been building you know, my backlist, my audience, I think the thing that, that I'm, that I like the most about my career is that I'm not known for one thing. I feel like everyone has a different favorite book of mine. And, and that, I think that helps with longevity and my career and, and bringing in new people is just the fact that I have a backlist of 23 different books that people can go and read. And it's not, just one series that I have out, you know, so I'm very grateful for that. Well, you can tell you feel a lot of gratitude too and feel very blessed. Um, I will try to squeeze in more questions because we're, yeah. we're getting close to the end. Uh, uh, this is from Julie S. in Fall River. She says, hi, Colleen. Can you tell us a little more about It Starts With Us? Will this pick up where it ends with us leaves off? It does. It picks up where, okay, so let me just explain how this book came to be. I have always said I'm never going to redeem Ryle. I didn't want to write a sequel. And that wasn't my plan, actually. Um, so many people have read this book in the last year or two that I get numerous messages and emails a day begging for more Atlas. And he wasn't in the book a whole lot. And so I decided to write a novella about Atlas and Lily. And that's where I was going with this. And I, I realized, my, well, my agent told me, you can't do that 
your pu your your publisher owns these characters, so you need to ask them if you can write it. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. So when I go to them, they're like, well, can you write a whole book? We would love a whole book. And I was like, I don't think so. I don't know if there's enough there to write a whole book. And so I said, no, I didn't take any money for it. But then a couple of months passed and the story kept building in my head. And I was like, you know, there's a lot that can be addressed here. Like how do Lily and Ryle co-parent? How does Atlas fit in the picture? What is Ryle's reaction when, At when he finds out Atlas and Lily are together? There was just so much that that I, I kept making notes. And then I was like, you know what, this this actually can be a book. And so <laughs> um, I decided oh. to write it. And, and it's mostly, I think, as a thank you. I'm writing it as a thank you to the readers who wanted more Lily and Atlas. I'm giving them more Lily and Atlas. And I'm, and I'm starting it off where the last book finished off. Um, and we're going to find out more about Atlas because he's going to have a point of view in this one. So I'm excited to write it. Um, I'm trying my best to keep it separate from It Ends With Us. That book is um, very special to me. And I, and I don't know that I can match it with this one. And I'm not even going to try. Like with this one, I'm writing it as a thank you, giving them more. But I really don't want to put these characters through a lot of hell and drama in order <laughs> to have a big plot twist. <laughs> So right. that's not my focus with this book. I just want to um, really give them a happily ever after. Great. That's a great response. Uh, and speaking of It Ends With Us, this is Rachel uh, Pesci from uh, Cohasset. She said, I've heard that It Ends With Us is being made into a movie. Could you talk more about when it's coming out and how you are, how involved you are with it? Um. I don't even, they don't even have actors yet. So we are far from, you know, a release date because it hasn't even started filming. I know they've just been working on the screenplay for the past year. Uh, you know, just Justin Baldoni got it and he had a few other projects that came before it and then COVID happened, which pushed everyone back. So they're actually this year, I think just really getting, getting into it. So I don't have dates. I don't have, you know, any idea who's going to act in it. I have not read a Stay tuned. Yet. Stay tuned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stay tuned because I, I really, I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. That's an answer in itself. All right. Yeah. But I, uh, they have five people asking this question. So um, <laughs> bear with me if you've kind of been asked or asked it again before, how do you come up with the ideas for your novels? I, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. Like there's not a way that I, um, you know, form ideas I just sit down and and usually it's either a character or a plot twist or an ending to the book there's one piece that that I come up with that I know will end up in a book and then I build everything around that and sometimes it's the title of the book I'll come up with a title and the reason the title is called that and then I'll build a book around that um it's just a lot of trial and error all right. Um, uh, just real quickly, we have time just, just this one last question. I think it could be quick from Lydia Swan. Do you listen to music while you write? No, I listen to music to get inspired to write, but I cannot have any noises while I write. I even take the batteries out of the clock. I need I need acts, absolute peace and quiet. Great. All right. And do you have a particular time that's best or it's just when the, the creative juices are flowing? Yeah, whenever the creative juices are flowing. I would love to be a morning writer. I'm not. I'm a middle of the night writer, unfortunately, and I hate that, but <laughs> that's when I tend to want to write. There you go. Well, I have, this has been wonderful. I've enjoyed uh, talking with you, asking all these questions, joining everybody that's joined us um, for uh, Beyond the Page. Colleen Hoover, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining and asking questions. Yes, everybody's been great with so many questions. I tried to get in as many as we could. Um, we want to thank everybody for tuning in to Beyond the Page tonight. We, of course, thank Colleen Hoover for joining us. And as she says goodbye, and I say so long, we are excited to announce next month's author as Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen, partnering to create novels such as The Wife Between Us, An Anonymous Girl, and their newest novel, the Golden Couple. So keep your eye out for upcoming emails to register for this event. And as always, you can join us, um, our Beyond the Page Facebook group, for even more discussion topics as you read through Greer and Sarah's work. Now, details are in the chat. Uh, you can see that right there. And in the event follow-up email that you will receive after joining us tonight. We hope you had an amazing night. I know I did. We cannot wait to see you again 
next month. I'm Marilyn Shera of GBH News. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, keep on reading.